Fine, so I want to talk about what a parse tree is. So the purpose of this is to visualize what a context-free grammar is actually doing. So context-free grammars are a way of applying rules to certain things in order to eventually generate a string, but it's not very visual. So let's just do a quick example. You may have seen the context-free grammar for balanced parentheses. And I'm going to put it here again. So a balanced set of parentheses is either an empty string, so we can have the empty string here, or what we can have is a left parenthesis followed by um, something that is balanced followed by a right parenthesis, so something like this, or we can have two sets of balanced parentheses next to each other. So I can have two set, uh, a set of balanced parentheses right here. So let's just try to visualize what is actually happening when I try to derive a string. Let's say that we want to derive the string left, left, right, right, left, right, parenthesis. So uh, we can see that this is balanced because this left parenthesis matches with this one, this one matches with this one, and then this one matches with this one, and uh, they're nested correctly. So how is this string actually generated in the grammar? Well, we always have to start with the start variable. And so the double arrow means that I'm applying a rule here. This is just saying that there's a left and a right side. Here I'm applying a rule. So we can apply, there's a whole lot of things that we can do here, um, but it, in general. But here I can only really apply this rule because if I apply this one, then that means that I'm gonna make that left parenthesis and then that right parenthesis over here, but I'm the stuff in the middle is not balanced on its own. So I need to apply the SS rule right here. So then this, the left S is going to generate this left half of the string, and then this S is gonna generate this right half. It's not necessarily the half, it's the second part, because these variables are independent of each other, they don't have to generate exactly the same length of string, or the same string at all. So let's work with the left S then. So I have the left S, and I want it to generate the left half of the string, the left part of it. So the only reasonable thing that we can do, because we have this nesting of lefts and rights here, I should apply this rule twice. Because if I apply this one, then I don't have that structure over here. This is the only reasonable one I can do. So let's apply that one. So we have left S, right S. So this second S is the same as that one, but this one is just uh, applying the rule on that S. So effectively, effectively that S got killed off and we got it here. So then now I'm going to apply the same rule again to the, the left S here. So that S is gonna go away and what we're gonna have is left, left, S, right, right, S. And then now since we have the two uh, nested parentheses or set of parentheses here, I want this S to go away because there's nothing in the inside here. So I'm gonna apply S goes to empty, which is one of those rules. So that S is gonna get killed off. And then I'm gonna get left, left, right, right, S. And then it's pretty obvious what the, the only variable s is going to do at this point. So we're going to kill that guy off. And then now we're going to apply left, left, right, right, left, s, right. And then one more rule application where we get rid of that s. And then we're going to have that s go to empty because that's one of the rules. So we're going to have exactly what we'd expect here, which is pretty cool. So it's, you can kind of see what's happening, right? You can see, okay, we we're replacing that thing with stuff, and then we replace that variable with stuff, replace that variable with stuff, replace it with stuff, replace it with stuff. But it's not really a visual thing. It, you can kind of, because I arranged it this way, it's kind of visual, but it's not really like a picture where you can actually see what's going on. So the way that a parse tree works is that what we do is we uh, start with the start variable at the top and we apply a rule like we did here 
And those things that are as the result of the variable being replaced with stuff appear as children underneath. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is, so this S right here, that's going to be the top of the tree. So let's, let's make that the S up here. I don't know why computer scientists want to have trees that grow down, not up. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's the way that this works. So here we replace this S with two S's. So the children underneath this are going to be the result of what the rule application was, which is replacing that S with two things, which are S's in this case. So the children underneath here are going to be uh, one S and then the other S. And the convention is this left S is going to be the actual left S. So that one's going to be that S. And this S is going to be that S. Okay. Uh, so the way that the parse tree works is we read it left to right. Of course, you can define it as reading right to left, but this is just the convention. So this S is going to be the one that we replaced on the left right here, which makes the, the double nested one here. And the S on the right side here is going to make the two little parentheses on the end. So what we do is this S right here, the one that's being pointed to in pink, was replaced with left S and then right. So then those are going to appear as children underneath that S. So this is going to have three things under it because we had the left parenthesis, which is a terminal, S, which is a variable, but a, variables can appear as nodes in this tree. And then we have the, the right here. So then we have, so the way I'm going to notate this is left and then S, I'm going to try to fit in there and then right parenthesis. So here, the nodes right here that correspond to the left and the right parenthesis because they are terminals, they're not going to have any children under them because it's a context-free grammar. We can only replace a single variable with stuff. We can't replace um, a terminal or anything else with, with stuff. So, but this S, because we, had, we replaced it with stuff, that's going to, uh, namely this one right here. In fact, I'm going to draw a line. So this S right here is going to be that S right there uh, because the pink one was right here and then the one that appears underneath is the one that appears immediately the rule application afterward. So then that's, that S is right there. Well, we replace that S with left S and then right. So then I'm going to have uh, left S and then right. So then what we can see is that this S that we just made is that S right there. And we notice that in this rule right here, we replaced S with empty, right? Because that's one of the rules that we applied. So then the child, the child underneath this one, you may think, well, it was replaced with nothing. So what do you do here? What we do is we actually put the empty string as a, uh, as a node in this tree. So the things that can be nodes in this tree are variables, which are clearly here, terminals, or the empty string. And, and those are the only things that can appear as nodes. So the node under here is going to be the empty string. And that's to symbolize the fact that we replace this particular S with empty. So then over here, what are we going to do? Well, this S, which is this orange one being pointed to, is the same one right here. It's the same one here. Now here, we replace this S with left S and then right. So let's go ahead and make that substitution. So we have left and then S. Maybe I should move that S over so I have some room. And then right. Okay. So then this S right here is the one inside the parentheses right before the very end right here. And right here, we, re we applied S goes to empty because there's nothing inside the parentheses anymore. So the child underneath here is going to be just the empty string. Okay. 
And so this is now a parse tree for this derivation right here. So remember, it's a derivation. If we start with the, the start variable and end with a string only composed of terminals, or the empty string, I guess, which is what we get here. Well, how do we actually read this parse tree? Well, what we do is we read the nodes left to right, uh, read the leaves from left to right. So if we read the leaves left to right, well, the, the leftmost leaf in this thing is that node right there. And then what is the next leftmost node, which is this one. And then uh, this one right here is the next leftmost one, leftmost one, next leftmost one. And then we come over here, here, and then here. So effectively, we're just reading the leaves from left to right. And then now we can reconstruct the original string using this particular representation. It's a different representation for context-free grammars in their derivations. So you can deal with grammars in this way, and it's, it's more formal. It, I, I agree. I see the value in having a derivation because it's completely formal. However, it's a lot easier to think about what's happening right here. So we can actually see the derivation happen just by going from the top and working your way down because the things that appear underneath a node are the result of applying a rule to that particular node. And we know that if a node has children underneath it, it must be a variable because it's a context-free grammar. You can only replace a variable with stuff. You can't replace anything else with stuff. And so that is what a parse tree is. It's a visual representation of what a context-free grammar is doing. What is the use of this? Well, you can prove certain things about what a grammar actually does. So what you can prove is that since this, just as an example, so look at this node right here. So there's an S obviously right here, and there's an obviously an S right here. So what we can notice is that it's the same variable in both places. So because it's the same variable, I can copy and paste this sub parse tree over to here. I can, I can copy and paste this sub parse tree to anywhere where there's an S because it doesn't matter what's around the S in the derivation. I can just copy and paste the parse trees around. Whereas a lot harder to see that over here because you have to kind of know, okay, I'm right here and I have a bunch of S's in my derivation. Where do I actually copy and paste and what do I copy and paste? Whereas here, it's a lot easier to see what's going on. So here, we can actually figure out from some parse tree what other strings can also be made. And another amazing fact is if you have a parse tree for some string when you read it left to right, that string must be able to be generated by the context-free grammar. So and the reason for that is you can verify whether it is. It, let's just say that we don't know whether this string is generated by the grammar. Well, we can see it just by going from the top down whether or not each of the rules was correctly applied. And if there wasn't one correctly applied, then we know that it couldn't have uh, been a valid derivation. And, that, and if you have a string that um, is not in the language of the grammar, it can't be made by this parse tree. So therefore, that actually tells us something really, really important, which is that parse trees are, in some sense, equivalent to derivations. So if you have a derivation for some string, you can convert it into a parse tree because you can just do the same procedure that we did here. Whenever you apply a rule, you put children underneath the variable that you replace stuff with with the stuff that you replace with. If you have a parse tree for something, then it turns out that you can actually have multiple different derivations because here there's no, um, because it's context free, uh, free here, we could have worked with this S first instead of this one because they're completely independent. So it turns out that they're equivalent to leftmost derivations. So leftmost is kind of what we did here, which is we always replace 
the leftmost variable in the derivation, which corresponds to the leftmost variable in the whole parse tree. So it turns out that they're equivalent to that, but there's some kind of coordination between these parse trees and leftmost derivations. And so we can, without loss of generality, talk about parse trees instead of derivations, which makes proving things a lot easier because it's a lot more visual. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave comments down below if you have any questions about parse trees, and I'll see you next time.